Good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's very, very important discussion. Um, and as healthcare providers serving the public housing um, primary care um, patients, we know chronic disease is actually one of the greatest challenges that we face. Um, so we are trying our best to make sure that we can enlighten you on um, community-based support um, for your older seniors um, who reside in public housing with chronic health conditions. Today's webinar training will help you as professionals learn about the impact, the risk, and the prevalence of chronic diseases and community-based support programs for your seniors in public housing with chronic health conditions. Now, during this webinar, you will learn about chron the chronic diseases, the prevalence, the impacts and risks, uh, self-management in terms of what it is and how it helps the patient. Um, you will also learn about chronic disease self-management program and about proven community-based interventions. Our presenters today are both from the National Council on Aging, Emily Desim and Christy Payton. So uh, a bit about today's agenda. We'll give you a brief overview of the National Council on Aging, and then we'll really focus in on chronic disease, so the prevalence of chronic disease, as well as its impact and risk. And then we'll focus on self-management. What is self-management? How does self-management help? And then we'll share an example of a proven community-based self-management program known as the Chronic Disease Self-Management self Program, which was developed and tested by Stanford University. So that's, that's how our presentation will flow today. About the National Council on Aging, we are a nonprofit service and advocacy organization, and our mission is, in, is to improve the lives of millions of older adults, especially those who are vulnerable and disadvantaged. At NCOA, we are a small but mighty organization, and, and it is our intent to impact the health and the economic security of millions of older adults throughout the country. We do have two arms within NCOA. Uh, one arm is health in the Center for Healthy Aging, and that is where Emily and I spend our time. And the other arm is uh, economic security, and, and those are our two core focuses of our work. And I know that there have been some other presentations offered that have been specific to economic security and benefits access. So we are a resource uh, as, as far as that topic is concerned. So let's start off with a bit of perspective on the older adult population in this country. As many of you know, I'm sure, we are in the midst of an age wave. Uh, I'm not really a fan of the term silver tsunami. I think about tsunamis being destructive and, and, you know, taking people's lives and destroying property, and, and it just sounds so negative in nature. So the term that I prefer to use is uh, the age wave instead of silver tsunami. I just think it's a more gentle term to use. Uh, but anyhow, at, at no other point in time has our country contained so many older adults. And I really like to focus in on two of the subpopulations of this group, the first being the young old, or those individuals who are between the ages of 65 and 74, and then take a closer look at the oldest old, or those who are over the age of 85. So when we look at the, the young old, the first wave of aging baby boomers, they reached full retirement age last year in 2011. And for the next 20 years, we'll have 74 million boomers who will retire. And what this equates to is more than 10,000 new retirees who are added to Social Security and the Medicare rolls every single day. So we've got 10,000 new people every day who are eligible for Social Security and who are eligible for Medicare. It's, it's pretty astounding. And then when we take a closer look at the oldest old, or those people who are 85 plus, we know that this is the fastest growing segment of our population, and we can even scale that back a few years to include those people who are 80 and above. They're our fastest growing cohort of adults. Their growth rate is twice that of those who are 65 and over, and almost four times that for the total population. And in the U.S., this group now represents 10% of the older population, but that's going to more than triple over the next 40, over the next 40 years. 
We also see a trend in a growing epidemic of chronic disease. Uh, perhaps it's not too surprising, but older adults, of course, are disproportionately impacted by chronic disease. We know that about 91% of older adults have a chronic disease, and approximately three quarters have two or more chronic diseases, and those are our individuals with what we call multiple chronic conditions. Uh, but what I think is also frightening is when we look at the left-hand side of the, the bar chart and we see those individuals who are between the ages of 0 and 19, 20 and, 20, 20 and 44, and 45 to 64, and we're seeing a, a large prevalence of chronic disease in these individuals as well, which is really foreshadowing uh, the, the, the growth in chronic diseases among older adults. So why do we care about chronic diseases? Why is it such a big deal, especially for the healthcare sector? And I think this slide really does a nice job of illustrating that multiple chronic conditions, especially those folks with two or more chronic conditions, they have a very high economic cost associated with them. We know that more than 1.7 million Americans die of a chronic disease each year, and it's just, it, an incredibly astounding figure so far as the, the cost associated with these conditions. If we look at diabetes at 23.1 billion, heart conditions are way up there at 69.3 billion, hypertension at 31.1 billion, there's just an incredible economic cost that our healthcare system is bearing. And when we consider that 10,000 new people every day are added to Medicare, our, our federal government and our other systems are bearing the cost of these diseases. So aside from the financial impact on the healthcare sector, we also know that people with chronic disease are reporting significantly reduced productivity. They live with less income, so right there we have a tie to economic security. They accomplish, they accomplish less, they spend more time in bed sick, they're not nearly as productive, and they have poor mental health. People with chronic conditions, we tend to see comorbidities with uh, depression and anxiety, and these um, mental health issues are, are increased in individuals with chronic conditions. So I'd like you to take a minute and, and take a closer look at this slide, and especially take a look at the blue portion of the slide, the 70% the as opposed to the red portion, which is the 30%, and, and think for a minute about what stands out about the portion of the slide that's blue. And what really stands out to me, or what was especially shocking to me when I looked at this graph, is that it highlights that the majority of risk factors for chronic diseases are within our own locus of control. So certainly there are 30% that are, you know, can be attributed to genetics or the social, the social determinants of health, such as access to health care. But by and large, the vast majority uh, of key risks for chronic conditions are controlled by us. They're, they're behavioral and environmental factors. We know that largely preventable and highly manageable chronic diseases account for 75 cents of every dollar we spend on health care in the U.S. But in contrast to that 75 cents, we're only spending less than 5 cents on prevention. So 5 cents on prevention, even though we know that the vast majority of risk factors are preventable. So we have a huge disparity there. And what else is interesting is that the World Health Organization and the CDC within our own country have estimated that 80% of heart disease, 80% of type 2 diabetes, and 40% of cancers can be prevented by doing three things. Those three things are eating better, exercising more, and avoiding tobacco. And I think that's worth repeating. 80% of heart disease, 80% of type 2 diabetes, and 40% of cancers. These are really prevalent, really high cost illnesses. And they can be prevented by doing three things, exercising, eating better, and avoiding tobacco products. Honest doc, if I'd known I was going to live this long, I'd have taken better care of myself. And I think what this really speaks to is quality of life. We know that we're living longer. That's, you know, the, the research and the data backs that up. However, what do we want those years to be like? And, and quality of life is certainly within our own locus of control, and, and there are things that we can do to ensure that our later years are quality years. And right now, I would like to turn the presentation over to my colleague, Emily Desim.
Great. Thank you, Christy. Um, that's a great segue into um, looking at what is self-management. Self-management involves a partnership between individuals and their health care providers. In this relationship, the individual has some responsibilities. Those include engaging in activities which promote their health, like exercising, monitoring and managing their system, symptoms day to day, and adhering to treatments that have been agreed to with health workers. When the individual has mastered these skills, they're said to be good self-managers. So how does self-management help? Um, first of all, it builds confidence or self-efficacy, which is a combination of the confidence level and knowledge to achieve something. So that is, um, one may have the confidence but not the knowledge, or the knowledge but not the confidence. Self-management can help in disease management by teaching the individual how to monitor, record, and respond to symptoms. Um, in role management by building partnerships that can include, that include taking an active role in planning care and responsibility and keeping to the plan. In emotional management by managing the emotional impact the disease has on their life, family, social, um, and economic factors. So there are self, several assumptions behind chronic disease self-management. First is that patients with different chronic diseases have similar self-management problems and disease-related tasks. Second, patients can learn to take day-to-day -day responsibility for their diseases. And finally, that confident, knowledgeable patients practicing self-management will experience improved health status and use fewer health resources. The self-management framework says that patients accept responsibility to manage or co-manage their own disease conditions. Patients become active participants in a system of coordinated health care, intervention, and communication. And patients are encouraged to solve their own problems with information, but not orders from professionals. So there are six principles of self-management behind chronic disease self-management. The first one is know your condition. Second, be actively involved in, in decision-making with your healthcare provider. Three, follow the care plan developed with your healthcare provider. Four, monitor sym symptoms associated with the condition and take appropriate action to respond and cope with the symptoms. Five, manage the physical, emotional, and social impact of the conditions on your life. And finally, adopt a lifestyle, lifestyle that promotes health and does not worsen the symptoms or the condition's impact. So let's do a deeper dive into one of the most widely implemented of the evidence-based health promotion programs, Stanford University's Chronic Disease Self-Management Program. Um, this program was developed in the early 90s at Stanford University and it's considered the gold standard of evidence-based health promotion programming. Um, it was tested via randomized controlled trials, so it's been proven to work. It's currently offered in 23 countries, 46 states, um, here in D.C. and also in Puerto Rico. So regardless of chronic condition, much of the physical and emotional challenge, challenges that impact people are similar in nature. For example, um, no longer being able to take part in activities you enjoy, dealing with pain and fatigue, etc. Another underlying premise of this program is that tr uh, with training and a detailed curriculum, people with chronic conditions are effective facilitators, just as much so as healthcare professionals. Participants respond well to their peers um, because they really feel that this person understands what I'm going through. CDSMP participants meet once a week for two and a half hours for six weeks, and they are offered a practical interactive curriculum Classes are a combination of short lectures and group discussion and problem solving. Workshop topics include um, medication usage, exercise and nutrition, stress management, talking with your doctor, and dealing with emotions and depression. Trained peer leaders offer guidance and support, but participants find practical solutions individually and together. Participants really are the experts in this program, and some of the best solutions for challenges are discovered by other group members as they've often faced a similar challenge and had to be creative in order to overcome it. While there is a detailed curriculum for the program, it's important to note that the workshops are not prescriptive. Participants choose their own goals and track their own progress towards success. CDSMT builds skills. It isn't a traditional health education where um, a professional provides you with information and reasons you should make certain life changes. Instead, participants in this program are given tools and resources and are empowered to make changes they determine to be important. So one of the ways that this happens is through action planning. 
Each week, the participants set a goal of something they'd like to accomplish, and then they report on their progress the following week. The goal is something the participant wants to achieve, and it isn't necessarily related to health. So the point isn't so much about the goal itself, but about building confidence through, achievement, through the achievement of the goal, which m motivates future goal setting. The benefits of CDSMP, CDSMP include fewer visits to physicians and emergency departments, fewer days in the hospital, fewer hospitaliz hospitalizations, um, the cost savings per participant are actually project projected to be between $390 and $750. Improved health status, decreased fatigue, and increased self-confidence. In short, participants regain control of their life and can do the things that matter to them. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Christy. Thank you, Emily. And I really just wanted to share some uh, data information just to demonstrate the reach of the program. Emily mentioned that it's, it's available in 46 states, D.C. and Puerto Rico, so chances are it's available in your state or in a community near you. Uh, a number of, of healthcare settings are offering the program. Residential settings are, off are also a great great site for the program as people find that when they're offered in public housing or other residential settings, it overcomes that barrier of transportation and access and, and people are naturally congregating there anyhow. So these are really great sites for the workshop and they've been offered there uh, throughout the country. I did want to demonstrate some of the, the data just to give you a, an idea of the scope of this program and how much it's growing. I should note that this data is specific to Administration on Aging funding of the program, and since 2006, AOA has supported evidence-based health promotion programs, uh, CDSMP in particular. In 2008, through the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, AOA invested $26.2 million into this program, into developing an infrastructure to offer the programs throughout the country, uh, which is why we see that huge leap in program participants in the year 2010 uh, to 49,891. And overall, we've had more than 125,000 participants who've, who've participated in the program. As far as uh, participant racial and ethnic demographics, we have succeeded in, in reaching a fairly diverse population. Uh, approximately one-third of our participants have identified with a racial minority group, so that could be uh, Asian, African American, Native American, Hispanic Latino, etc. Uh, the only version of the program that's a cultural translation is the Spanish version, which is known as Tomando Control de su Salud. Um, but all of the other, you know, this program is offered in multiple languages so that it can be tailored to various populations. Uh, but like I said, the only one that has a, a very specific cultural translation is the one that's offered for, for Spanish speakers. But we do know that individuals are offering the program throughout the country in, in Vietnamese and Tagalog and, and a, a number of um, different communities and different languages. As far as our participant characteristics, nearly 74% are over the age of 60, and that's really um, a tribute to the Administration on Aging funding because they did fund the state units on aging throughout the country, which then funded their um, area agencies on aging, which funded senior centers, and so on. That's not to be said that this is an exclusively aging services-based program. Uh, we do have a, a fair amount of, of host organizations who are offering the program who are outside of the aging services network who might be a federally qualified health center or another uh, type of public clinic, um, housing, like I said earlier, other um, churches, um, those sorts of organizations. So this isn't necessarily a program that's just for older adults, but we do know that older adults have the highest prevalence of chronic diseases so, you know, there are, the, the population is just ripe for this type of program. We also know that about 78% of our participants are female. We're, we're working hard to try to enroll more, more men in our program, but for those of you who have experience with, with health education or any kind of group-based workshop, you may see uh, a similar trend where it can be more difficult to enroll men in these workshops, but we, we would like to enroll more men because we know that men have chronic diseases and can benefit from the program. 
uh, we are reaching a vulnerable population. So far as nearly 47 percent are, are living alone. So these are individuals who don't necessarily have a full-time caregiver present or a spouse or family or uh, someone else who they're living with. Uh, I already mentioned the racial and ethnic data. And we also know, astoundingly, that 60 percent of participants have multiple chronic conditions. So these are our individuals with more than one chronic condition, oftentimes, you know, two, three, four, five chronic conditions. So definitely a group that can benefit from this type of workshop. And then as far as those chronic conditions that people are reporting, the most commonly reported are hypertension, arthritis, and diabetes, and those are in line with the most common chronic conditions in the general population and often the most costly chronic conditions. And so far as diabetes, there is a diabetes-specific version of the program called the Diabetes Self-Management Program. Um, however, it, it, the program itself is not disease-specific. So an individual with diabetes may elect to take the Diabetes Self-Management Program, or they may be enrolled in the standard chronic disease self-management program because it's not so much about the disease itself. It's not that we're grouping people with heart disease into one program or people with diabetes into another program because the curriculum is not specific to the, to the, the disease. The curriculum is specific to how people are coping with the disease and, and the various issues and the various stressors that come with having a chronic disease, not so much how to manage a specific disease. So it's it's really a great workshop so far as involving a, a breadth of people in together. Our implementation sites, as you can see here, you know, not too surprisingly, 24% uh, of our implementation sites are senior centers, which, like I said, is because of the nature of the funding. Uh, but 23%, nearly, nearly a quarter, are within the healthcare sector, and I think that's a real paradigm shift. I think. What's so exciting about that to me as, as the person who looks really closely at our data is that this represents that this program, which has traditionally been offered in the Aging Services Network, is offered for the most part by lay people who don't have any sort of health training or health background, that this program is being embraced by the healthcare sector and is being offered to their patients or their consumers because they're seeing it as an effective tool and an effective resource that's not just for the Aging Services Network. And of course, 16% of our implementation sites are, are residential facilities. So we do see a fair amount of um, workshops that are happening within, within the housing sector. And, and as much as, you know, as the person who manages the database here at NCOA, as much as I love to see that, that data come in, uh, what's equally as powerful, if not more powerful, are the participant testimonials and, and how participants are reacting to the program and what they have to say. And you know, you can read the, the testimonials for yourself on the screen there, but it's really about empowerment and it's really about people seeing that they are not alone, that you know, they thought that the symptoms that they were having or the frustrations that were a result of their chronic disease were something that just they were feeling, that just they were experiencing. And that can be so overwhelming and it can be really consuming for a person. But to suddenly be surrounded by people who are feeling those same things and going through those same issues and who have had those same challenges and to work together to problem solve around that and to realize that you can overcome those barriers and those challenges is really, really empowering for people. As I mentioned earlier, CDSMP is available throughout the country. You can visit us on our website at ncoa.org backslash CHA, and you'll see a nice little map. I believe it's on the right-hand column of our page near the bottom. Emily's nodding. She's our web person. Uh, you'll see a, a really nice map. You can click on the map and click on your state, and you'll find the state point of contact, and you can, you can get in touch with them, find out if there's a workshop in your area, uh, if you'd like to either, you know, have a partnership with whatever the community-based organization is that's offering the program in your area, if you'd like to embed this program within your own organization, within your own site, you know, we can certainly, Emily and I can link you with those resources. And there, other than Emily and I, there are state points of contact available on this map. The only four states that right now we don't have a point of contact for are um, Wyoming, 
North Dakota, South Dakota, and Montana. So if you're in one of those states, get in touch with Emily and I. We'll, we'll see what we can do to, to hook you up with another program. Uh, but unfortunately, those four states right now don't have a solid CDSMP infrastructure. But the majority of, of the rest of the country does have something that we can link you to. So to learn more, visit us online, like I said. Uh, in addition to the map, we've got a variety of tools. We have fact sheets, resources, webinars, learning modules, basically anything and everything that you want to know about evidence-based healthy aging programs, not just the chronic disease self-management program, but falls programs, mental health, um, behavioral health, medication management, you know, so on and so on. We have really great resources on our website, and we do encourage you to check them out. And with that, I know we've got quite a bit of time left for questions. So I, you know, if we have any questions, I haven't seen any come through to the chat yet. But if anyone does have any questions, please feel free to type them in and, and let us know. And Emily and I are always available at any time via email. You can reach out to us and uh, ask any questions that you have. Okay, thank you so much, Emily and Christy. <clears throat> and I just want to remind everyone to please use the Q&A um, feature to type in any of your questions. Um, I, I had um, have a question here, Emily or Christy, whoever would feel happy to answer. You mentioned that there was a diabetes program um, in place, a specific one. The question is, do you know if there are any others that are considered to be done in the future? Uh, well, right now there is a diabetes-specific version of the program, uh, there's an arthritis-specific version of the program, and there's, em Emily's mentioning these as well, sorry, we're tag-teaming here. There's uh, one specifically for individuals with uh, HIV and AIDS, known as the Positive Self-Management Program, and there's a, a Pain Self-Management Program as well. So, and I believe there's a Cancer Survivors Program, but right now that's being tested with the American Cancer Society and isn't necessarily available widely. Um, so think of the Chronic Disease Self-Management Program as the, the overarching, I have a coworker who refers to it as disease agnostic program that anyone and everyone can participate in, but there are some other disease-specific programs um, that are out there. The, the generic CDSMP is what's most widely offered throughout the country, and then I would say, you know, the, the diabetes self-management would be the next one, and the others are offered on a, a more limited basis, but of course Stanford University does offer trainings for those other programs uh, if you are interested in learning more about them or, um, or offering them within your own organization. Great. We do have another question. Um, can you give us some examples of some kinds of benefits people may have experienced using the program? Sure. Actually, uh, one that comes to mind for me just recently, Hawaii is one of the states that I work with as a grantee. And uh, they sent in this lovely booklet of, of participant testimonials. And there was an individual who had noted that she had gone through the program and it had helped her quit smoking. And what really stood out to me was the fact, and you know, we have to keep in mind that this is from Hawaii, is that she said that she used to step out a couple of times a day, whether it was rainy or cold, and she would have a cigarette. And I laughed to myself a bit because I thought, okay, well, I understand Hawaii, they get rain, it's tropical. But I thought, well, how cold can it really get in Hawaii? Uh, you know, that it's uncomfortable, uncomfortable for her to step outside and have a cigarette. But nonetheless, she credited the program with um, helping her to stop smoking. Uh, we also have a, another individual who was featured on our website, Walter Langford, who's just a, a true proponent of the program, who um, had a heart attack or a stroke, I believe, some years ago, was a self-proclaimed junk food junkie who was, you know, drinking a couple Dr. Peppers a day and and, you know, washing down some candy bars and chips with those Dr. Peppers. And after his stroke kind of had a, you know, a come to Jesus moment and realized that this was no way that, that, you know, he couldn't continue living his life this way. 
ended up enrolled in CDSMP, lost, I believe it was 40 or 60 pounds. It was significant weight loss and was such a believer in the program that he became a master trainer, meaning that, you know, he's somebody who now trains other people to facilitate the program. So, you know, weight loss, quitting smoking, and just general management of your disease, not feeling encumbered by, by the symptoms or by the, the negative side effects of your disease, um, but it's, you know, becoming more socially active and socially engaged and, and just living your life the way that you want to live your life and, and not feeling so, um, not feeling like your disease is in control, but you're in control. Oh, wonderful. Can you describe some of the self-management tools that people learn in the program? Sure. Do Emily, do you want to take that? Sure, sure. Um, so the program covers a, a variety of ta uh, topics, and in each of those topics, um, through kind of goal setting and brainstorming, participants really become empowered. Um, they also work on um, kind of stress management, so relaxation and breathing, um, learning more about how they can exercise and um, nutrition, um, talking with their doctor and really feeling empowered to take control of their health. Yeah, I, th I think communication is mm -hmm. really key. It's communication with physicians, communication with friends and family. Uh, you know, I, I know examples of myself when I, when I go to see a physician and after I leave, I think, oh gosh, I really should have asked that. Or he told me that I need to do this, but I don't really understand what it is that, that he or she wants me to do. And it's, it's, being able to better prepare for physician visits, knowing when you're in the physician's office, what types of questions you can ask, and having those questions ready, and communicating with your friends and family. You know, I think a lot of times people feel really alone when they have chronic diseases and aren't, aren't so comfortable expressing themselves or expressing what they need or expressing how others can help them. And, and you know, it's really... The communication is key, and like Emily mentioned, mentioned the, the relaxation techniques, the pain management uh, techniques, and, um, you know, nutrition, those sorts of things. It's very holistic and, and uh, you know, en encompasses a wide variety of, of tools. Excellent. Um, one of the um, grantees just sent me an email as well asking, do you know of any chronic um, disease management programs um, that where they provide state-funded programs that can better serve their patients? Yeah, do I you mean, have I any need, Yeah, I would need some more detail on that, but if, if you can please, Dr. Webb, direct that individual to get in touch with Emily and I and uh, we'll do our best to, to link them up. Just, I, it depends on what their state is, what types of program they're looking for, uh, that sort of okay. thing. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I don't see any more questions in the queue, so again, if anyone has um, further questions, please um, use the Q&A feature. I do want to mention that um, <clears throat> this, um, this topic was actually presented as well, at our national conference um, that took place about two weeks ago, May 1st through the 3rd. Um, and again, these webinars will be available on our website. Um, they are right now being taped um, so that we can have the audio transcribed version available for you as well. And um, by the end of June, we will actually have a transcribed copy available for those who may be hearing impaired. Um, so again, you know, if you have any questions, um, both Emily and Christy provided their email addresses here. Um, Emily's email address is emily.desem, D-E-S-S-E-M, at ncoa.org. And then Christy is christy.pattern, P-A-T-T-O-N, at ncoa.org. And um, they're both available. We really... Um, are fortunate here at the National Center for Health and Public Housing to have to work alongside with the National Council on Aging. They have a tremendous number of resources that are available to you as well. Um, we do have a question. What was the address in Virginia? 
I'm not so sure. Um, uh, Angela, if you can type who you're referring to um, for that question, I'm sorry, we're kind of unclear. Um, it so might be the, on the slide. If you're looking for, um, we do have the state map with all of the different state contacts, and that's okay. at ncoa.org backslash CHA, and we will have a Virginia contact there. I don't know if that's Excellent. helpful. Thank you. And please utilize the ncoa.org website. They have tremendous resources available for you. Also, we have them linked to our website as well. So for those of you who have requested um, training and technical assistance in these areas, um, we do reference um, the NCOA as one of the resources for you. Um, so we uh, encourage you to really take advantage of them. Um, we, their fact sheets are tremendous. It's wonderful for you in terms of writing grants. And we do know there are a couple of opportunities available for U.S. health centers um, to look at this particular area. So feel free to restore, you know, reference their data on um, seniors across the country, um, especially those in, um, um, in underserved areas as well. So that is an opportunity for you. Um, I think we have one or two other people typing in their questions in the queue, and as they're doing that, I do want to remind you or let you all know that we do have another webinar um, scheduled for May 23rd um, about communications and a better understanding of ACOs and Medicare, Medicaid. Um, and again, um, there will be some discussion on how some of those um, uh, financial reimbursements will apply for chronic disease management as well. Okay, so um, another question would be, how would this program work in a patient-centered medical home model, which is what the current model for the PHPC program? Emily or Christy? Sure. Uh, actually, we, we do have a couple of organizations and a couple of sites who are partnering with healthcare organizations that are implementing the patient-centered medical home model. And uh, I, I do know that one of the requirements of or one of the suggestions for the patient-centered medical homes is that there is a, a partnership with and a referral to community-based resources. So this really, um, you know, this, this fits the bill so far as being able to refer to or embed a, a community-based resource within that model as well as the, um, the, the self-management requirement of the patient-centered medical home model because it, it is a very uh, holistic, overarching type of program that it isn't necessarily a, it is not a clinical-based model, um, but rather it does fulfill that self-management uh, component. Excellent, thank you for that. Um, um, okay, well, we don't have any more questions in the queue, but what I would like to ask, um, if there are a couple of, you know, we'll wait a couple of seconds, another minute, and I do want to remind um, those of you on the call, um, please do um, fill out our per post survey. Um, this will give us an opportunity of, to figure out exactly what kind of um, future webinars, um, get a feedback on the information that's shared with you in terms of resources and tools, um, and what we will do is follow back with you and provide some follow-up to see how helpful this is in information has been to you, and so to help HRSA really better understand um, how we're meeting some of your needs. So please uh, fill out the post survey Please also, um, you should know that if you need to contact us here at the National Center for Health and Public Housing, um, you can reach us at our, through our website at nchph.org. And again, all of the PowerPoints um, for this webinar and the future audio version will be available as well. Um, I do want to thank today's presenters, Emily and Christy, for this um, very enlightening discussion. I know we had some great feedback from those participants at our national conference on this topic, and um, your resources have been uh, tremendous support for a lot of them. 
So thank you again for taking the time out and um, um, participating on today's webinar and for your expertise. And, um, you know, I don't see that we have any other questions. Any final take-homes from Emily and Christy? Well, we definitely want to thank you for having us. Um, we really appreciate this opportunity to share about this important program and about the um, impact and importance of chronic diseases in this population. Yep, we just encourage you to reach out to us. Uh, we, we thank you, Dr. Webb, for inviting us and for talking up our website and our fact sheets. And, and we do hope that, that they're helpful to your network. And any of us here absolutely. at the Center for Healthy Aging are, are absolutely available to, um, to answer any questions or to provide any follow-up. So please feel free to reach out to us uh, on a variety of topics. Like I said, not just chronic disease, but we also have expertise in, in falls prevention and other areas. Absolutely, and we thank you all for joining us today. Wherever you are across the country, please do not hesitate to contact me or any member of our staff. And again, NCOA is a resource for you as well. Um, and feel free to contact our presenters today. So um, we got a message, thank you from Baltimore, Maryland. So, so thank you so much, everyone, for joining today's webinar. Thank you. Thank you.